recording. Great. So welcome everyone to this uh, webinar, Challenging the Repression of Palestinian Rights Advocacy. Uh, great to see so many of you attending. Uh, my name is Thomas Fogo, Project Lead Israel-Palestine at Pax, uh, one of the organizers of this event. Um, together with Al Haq, SOMO, the European Legal Support Center and the Rights Forum. Also, of course, a special welcome to our speakers, Wissam Ahmed, Giovanni Fassina and Lydia De Leo, whom I will introduce at a later stage. Um, as you're all most likely aware, a month ago, Israel designated six prominent Palestinian human rights NGOs and civil society organizations as terrorists. During this webinar, we'll try to uh, shed some light on that, discuss the implications of this repression on Palestinian civil society. I will also address the responsibilities of third states parties, such as the Netherlands and concrete actions we should expect from our authorities. Uh, we will highlight the importance of civic space for human rights advocates in the context of Israel and Palestine in general, but also how it's connected to shrinking civic space in the Netherlands. Uh, and we will also provide some concrete examples of suppression of civic space in the Netherlands. Uh, but before we start some housekeeping and logistical notes, uh, we start with the presentations of our three speakers and at the, at the end of the session, there will be a Q&A. Uh, so questions can be po posed in the Q&A box, which is most likely at the bottom of your screen. Um, and of course, feel free to already ask questions you might have during the presentations of our speakers. Uh, so then we can address them at the end of the, uh, of the webinar. And maybe some questions we can already answer. Uh, during the, the speakers, during the speeches of the speakers. Um, in case you might encounter any technical difficulties, please just send a message to all speakers and moderator uh, via the chat function and my colleagues will assist you. Um, I see that some more people are dropping in right on time. Um, then I think we are good to go. Uh, and I would like to introduce our first, first speaker, Wissam Ahmed. So Wissam Ahmed is a Palestinian American born and raised in the US. He has a BA and Juris Doctorate from Louisiana State University and an LLM from the Irish Center for Human Rights in Galway. He has been working as a human rights advocate with Al Haq since 2006, where he is now the director of the Applied Center for International Law and coordinator of Al Haq's business and human rights program. His area of research focuses on the economic incentive structure, perpetuating the colonization of Palestine along business lines. Uh, we Sam will provide us with some background to the decision to label the six NGOs as terrorists, of which Al Haq is one of them. Um, and Al Haq, as you might know, is one of the oldest Palestinian rights groups, one of the organizations providing input for the ongoing ICC investigation, and winner of many awards, including the Geuze Penning, which is a Dutch prize for human rights defenders. Uh, go ahead, We Sam, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Thomas, for the opportunity. Uh, and thank you for everyone uh, for participating and uh, taking uh, concern to the recent developments. And um, I think, uh, you know, I, I want to put everyone in a picture of uh, the situation within the broader context uh, of, uh, of, as you mentioned, the issue of uh, shrinking civil space. Uh, um, and Israel's attack on Palestinian civil society has been ongoing uh, for, for years. And uh, this recent uh, escalation falls within this broader uh, tactic that has been ongoing. And uh, over the years, Israel has very much been playing on the issue of behavioral psychology and connecting in the conflation of terminology of anti-Semitism, terrorism, uh, BDS, uh, human rights advocacy for Palestinians, Israel's existence, all these things are put in a narrative uh, to uh, to make people associate uh, Palestinian human rights work um, in a negative light. And I think uh, uh, this uh, is a part of the, the challenge that we are facing now in having to bear the burden of proof of addressing Israel's allegations that are unfounded in the first place, but them being taken uh, at face value from uh, our European allies um, and counterparts uh, that... Uh, are waiting to see what evidence uh, Israel is providing. And I think it's the, the recent developments very much call into question Israel's uh, uh, evidence and its methods of operation and how it uh, 
it uh, um, engages uh, with the uh, Palestinian civil society. The recent revelations with regard to the, the Pegasus uh, spyware being used on Palestinian uh, human rights defenders um, is, is very much a part of Israel's ability to uh, exploit the captive population in Palestine and develop uh, uh, this kind of technology and use it and abuse it and then also market it uh, outside where it's used against human rights defenders elsewhere as well. And I think uh, uh, what we see is considering the power that Israel has as an occupying power in control of a population and the ability to develop such technology puts within its uh, power the ability uh, to uh, to control the the connections um, that exist at a digital level and uh, and uh, require us to really scrutinize and call into question the possibilities of the fabrication of evidence that can be used and this was the thread that uh, we started pulling when we became aware of the suspicious uh, um, activity on one of our colleagues' phones and so. Once uh, we became aware of this uh, and, and uh, gave it to a third party to investigate, um, it became it's clear that the Israelis uh, were also um, put on notice that uh, the Pegasus software was uh, discovered. Um, and uh, this has been a part of the, the narrative in the media that uh, it played a role in uh, having Israel move forward with this uh, additional step of escalation and the designation of the organizations was the discovery of the Pegasus software. And I think, uh, you know, this is part of the, uh, the broader uh, policy uh, that Israel is using to uh, try to distract uh, Palestinian civil society from the work that it's doing and create this uh, climate of fear in engaging with Palestinian civil society. And it is something that, as uh, our European allies, uh, especially in the Netherlands, um, Israel is playing to that uh, simple uh, human nature element of fight or flight. And Israel is betting on flight. Israel is trying to escalate the concerns around engaging and continuing the Palestinian solidarity uh, network and the support that exists with, uh, with these six organizations and Palestinian civil society as a whole, because these six organizations are very much interconnected with Palestinian civil society throughout. And this uh, is an important uh, component um, and, and the recent escalation needs to be seen within this much uh, broader context. And it's also important to keep in mind that these tactics of outlawing organizations or designating them as terrorists, uh, um, these aren't unique to the Palestinian context. Uh, and the tactic being used against human rights defenders. It's been used in uh, the Americas, it's been used in Africa, it's been used in the Asia Pacific. Um, it is not a new tactic and on the contrary, it is part of the relationship, relational dynamics between the colonizer and the colonized. Um, and uh, it is not surprising that Israel in its policies would deal with Palestinian civil society in their struggle for the right to self-determination to use this tactic against them. And really what's most concerning, I think, uh, for the broader international system of uh, the human rights regime and how it's evolved is over the years, and Al-Haq's uh, development as well, has been very much around uh, these tools that the international community has designated for us to be able to use in the process of decolonization, in the process of the right to self, the struggle for the right to self-determination, the tools that have been made available through the international system, international law and the international mechanisms that are available, including the International Criminal Court. But because we have been able to use these tools in a manner that still causes discomfort to Israel and its broader policies and colonial ambitions, uh, this is um, the response that we get uh, to try to remove us from the equation um, as an obstacle to that broader policy. And obviously this sends a, a, a dangerous message to international civil society as a whole and the faith in the international system functioning on the basis of the rule of law. And we feel like this issue needs to be seen much bigger than the six Palestinian organizations uh, uh, 
um, on the radar now because these kind of tactics uh, can be applied further to other organizations within the Palestinian context, but also elsewhere as well. And if Israel is able to get away with it, others will be able to as well. And Israel has been always uh, been able to play on uh, the sense of exceptionalism within the international system. But in order for a system to maintain its integrity, there can be no exceptions. And so long as Israel is able to flout this impunity that it enjoys and engage with the international community in this manner, uh, a, a very arrogant manner, um, and, uh, and use its power uh, in a way to undermine the possibility and the potential for Palestinian civil society to function, it threatens the integrity of the rule-based system of international law as a whole. And I think uh, uh, it's, uh, it's an opportunity for international civil society to really stand up and the international community to push back and tell Israel enough is enough. The impunity that you have enjoyed, you are exploited. And uh, these escalations are a sign that your accountability is necessary and is a, recognized as a threat uh, to the integrity of the international system as a whole. And the role that you as European allies, Dutch civil society um, play an important role in contributing to that broader uh, support system. And how we move forward is very much going to be dependent on how you engage as European and Dutch civil society with these Palestinian organizations and the role that you play in contributing to holding Israel accountable for these actions. And so I'm very happy to have my uh, colleagues here uh, from SOMO and ELSC uh, to contribute to the discussion on the role that uh, European civil society can play because we feel that Palestinian civil society is very much an integral part of international civil society and we have to function uh, together as a whole to, uh, to overcome these challenges. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Wissam, for your uh, contribution, uh, for providing a bit more background to that decision, and also your call upon the, uh, the international community and Dutch civil society in particular. In case people have any questions for Wissam, please drop them in the Q&A box. Um, then it's time for our second speaker of this evening, Giovanni Fassina. He is the program director of the European Legal Support Center. The ELSC is the first and only organization that defends and empowers the Palestinian solidarity movement in Europe, including the UK, through legal means. The ELSC provides free legal advice and assistance to associations, NGOs, groups, and individuals advocating for Palestinian rights. It was established by the Palestinian network of NGOs, Pingo, and the Rights Forum in Amsterdam in 2019. Before starting the ELSC, Giovanni has worked in a human rights firm in Italy and in the occupied Palestinian territory in the development sector. Uh, welcome, Giovanni. Um, and you will shed some light on the legal implications of the decision, as well as more in general about the tactic of using lawfare. The floor is yours, Giovanni. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Thomas. Uh, and uh, also thanks, uh, Wissam, for your... Uh, uh, for your introduction and, and for your speech, which is indeed quite, quite important. Uh, yeah, indeed, during my presentation, I will, as, as Thomas was suggesting, I will try, first of all, uh, to clarify very briefly what can be the legal, uh, the legal implication from the, uh, from the European uh, uh, law perspective of a designation. And then uh, I will indeed uh, give you a bit more context of lawfare and what we uh, saw as lawfare, especially in, in the Netherlands. So first of all, indeed, I would like to mitigate some concerns about what the designation means in Europe. And technically speaking, uh, the designation does not have any direct legal effect uh, because uh, the designation applies only to Israel and to the occupied Palestinian territory and for becoming a real uh, ban, also, I mean, for, for having any kind of effect in Europe, uh, there should be also a decision by the European Council to include al haq and potentially also the other entities, the other um, NGOs, in a special list of persons and entities which are subjected to EU restrictive measures. So uh, until uh, uh, the, uh, these, these NGOs are not included in this list, the European list, 
uh, of prescribed of terrorist organizations. Uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this really designation is basically absolutely not effective in Europe. And of course, there are, uh, uh, there are limited chances that this will happen for many reasons, because also the procedure for which the European Council should uh, adopt such a decision uh, is absolutely uh, um, is is uh, um, require uh, the the council to take into consideration also the kind of evidence for uh, for um, potentially listing an organization as terrorist, and this evidence needs to meet very clear, very uh, very high standards. And in in our case, uh, plus nineteen seventy two and intercept. Uh, publish uh, uh, like an article where they were disclosing some information about this evidence. And the information revealed in this article clearly shows how also in this case, this evidence is uh, uh, absolutely do not meet uh, the required standards acceptable in European Union. Basically in the article, it shows that uh, uh, what Israel put forward was a transcription made by Israeli officers of an, inter of, of an interrogation with two former employees of uh, a Palestinian NGO. And uh, during this interrogation, uh, I mean, the, the, uh, so the, the transcript of this interrogation has been also completed and, 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 uh, and finalized by Israeli officials. And the lawyers of these two individuals also are claiming, are, 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 um, are complaining about torture. It's clear that if this is the main piece of evidence they have, these clearly do not meet any kind of standards which is, uh, uh, which is provided by uh, EU, um, EU Charter of Fundamental Rights and European Convention of Human Rights. And it's clear, therefore, that the uh, European Union and uh, European, government, uh, European member states government should absolutely reject uh, indeed the designation and express uh, concern about uh, this, this decision. So if uh, on the one side, the designation does not have a legal effect, anyway, it's indeed very worrying. And it's clear that the main, uh, the main goal of uh, this designation is to push for the defunding of the organization. They want to create uh, uh, a negative, uh, uh, um, the designation aims to badly perceive the organization as, uh, as want to taint this organization and to make more and more difficult for the European governments to keep supporting financially uh, uh, the work, uh, the, the extremely important work that uh, uh, these uh, civil society organizations are carrying out. Uh, and uh, indeed, uh, the, the, this is uh, uh, this is extremely, of course, uh, problematic, uh, and actually it fits perfectly within uh, uh, the legitimiz legitimization tactic that uh, uh, at the LSE we've been documenting and observing uh, in a recent report. Also, we we published. Uh, the idea of uh, labeling uh, human rights defenders as uh, terrorist or anti-Semite uh, is part of uh, indeed a pattern that uh, we observed uh, Europe-wide. And in a recent report we published, we mostly focus on the Netherlands and we try to better have a better understanding and a better, uh, yeah, better understanding on uh, uh, who are the main uh, actors involved uh, 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 in, this, uh, in carrying out these delegitimation tactics and how these attacks take place. Uh, so what was very interesting in our report uh, um, was uh, in the report, we found 76 incidents, which are different kinds. We have uh, smear campaigns, uh, uh, closure of bank accounts, and also what we call defunding. The funding means uh, when it comes to the fundings, the fundings is a tactic where a specific actor is spreading uh, this information with the aim indeed to stop and cut the financial support from an entity to a specific organization which does, who does advocacy for Palestinian rights. Uh, from 2015 and 2020, we identified at least 12 attempts of the funding in the Netherlands. Uh, 
uh, with um, in, in regard on uh, so who, who carry out these attacks, uh, we identified two main actors. On the one side, we have primary actors who are responsible for the uh, for the defunding attack. And these actors, most of the time, are uh, pro-Israel advocacy groups, which are or in the Netherlands or in Israel. And these groups are indeed like organizations such as NGO Monitor, Shurat Adin, International Legal Forum, uh, and who are based in Israel. And then we have also uh, in the Netherlands some pro-Israel advocacy groups, which uh, uh, basically copy and paste the allegation that these groups are putting forward and amplify them in the Dutch political and uh, uh, media uh, em environment. Uh, these are a small number of Dutch organizations, not too many. In other countries, the situation is kind of quite worse. But it's very interesting to see how these groups uh, work in coordination with each other uh, for pushing forward these attacks. Um, and the second actor um, is what we call enabler third parties. Enabler third parties are mainly political parties or media outlets, some media outlets, that voluntarily or without appropriate fact checking uh, amplify the uh, messages and the allegations put forward by uh, the primary actors. And uh, I will give you a, like a very clear example of them, of one of them. Uh, so basically, in uh, January 2020, in the NGO Monitor, for instance, they published a report on another, another Palestinian NGO, Al Mizan. Uh, Al Mizan uh, is a human rights organization based in Gaza. They do advocacy work also uh, before the International Criminal Court. So they publish this report uh, making very, very inflammatory allegation that uh, many uh, that the individuals working for organizations and the organization per se have ties with uh, uh, a proscribed group, uh, namely Hamas or the PFLP. And uh, uh, immediately after the release of, the, of, of this report, uh, we saw uh, pro Israeli Dutch groups like uh, uh, CD, Center for Documenting uh, Anti Semitism, uh, and, and others which and which uh, immediately uh, republish and, and sponsor i would say the report uh, and then we had like uh, the dutch right wing newspaper like the telegraph which started uh, writing articles about the report and then we had uh, uh, and, and and this so basically is a kind of build, they, they start building pressure uh, till uh, um, uh, far right uh, MPs from the far right parties, Party for Freedom, the party of uh, builders, they made uh, parliamentary questions, uh, uh, questioning uh, the uh, Dutch government, uh, asking clarification to the Dutch government on why they were funding an organization that in theory is alleged to be uh, to be a terrorist organization. So this for us was very interesting because this really is a perfect example on how you know, they, they, they create a wave which it's, it's, it's aimed to indeed uh, smear and, and, and taint uh, the, the, the organization. This is only one of the main example and for us was the most relevant one because in this case, the Dutch government for the first time issued a very good response where they completely rebut and they completely dismiss the allegations saying the allegation were extremely vague that the fact that mm, they, they clarified that uh, some individuals in theory, which in theory were supposed to be uh, affiliated with the proscribed group uh, were actually uh, not, not alive anymore. So information was very uh, outdated. Uh, and uh, uh, it take a really strong stance in refusing indeed this, uh, this, uh, um, this accusation, which uh, uh, is something, uh, it's something I would say is yeah, still uh, remarkable. Um, and this is exactly what uh, is needed now after the designations. Uh, the, main, uh, indeed, the, main, the main issue, the main problem we have been seeing is the reluctance of, uh, uh, of, of um, governments and the European Commission to take a strong stance against uh, uh, again, against these accusations. And, and, and so this is either kind of very problematic because uh, uh, it potentially open, uh, could create doubts about the fact that uh, 
the designation is absolutely uh, it, it is baseless and 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 um, and it should be rejected. Uh, I would like then to 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 conclude uh, also uh, quoting from uh, the, the the military or um, quoting not military or sorry i would like to um, conclude quoting the uh, some parts of the uh, designation uh, which was made against indeed the halak so when benny Gantz, the minister of defense issued the designated the, the ngo uh, there is a, 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 there are a few lines which are very very interesting uh, where basically they uh, they outline the cause uh, for uh, designating uh, Alak as a, as a terrorist organization. And uh, it says, I'm reading, Alak was established in 1979 and became an arm of the Popular Front from the Liberation of Palestine. Uh, the declared Alak activities are in the field of human rights protection. However, in practice, it is engaged on the behalf of the Popular Front in the promotion of steps against Israel in the international arena which constitutes part of uh, the organization of uh, the, the PFLP struggle against Israel. This is for me a, a very good example because uh, uh, it's a steps against Israel in the international arena, which in clearly includes legal steps and legitimate form of advocacy that are widely protected in you and in the Netherlands. So, uh, Mm, uh, and, and here I conclude, uh, it's, it, it's clear that this designation did, is a combination of, uh, of, of, of attacks that started way longer ago. Uh, and this is exactly the moment where like the European Union, but also the Dutch government and other state needs to decide where to stand. They can stand protecting uh, uh, human rights defenders or they can, uh, if I don't do that, they can become actually enabler uh, third party and can en enabler, enabler uh, um, lawful organizations uh, to uh, um, keep har harassing and, and uh, um, har harassing um, uh, human rights organizations. Thanks a lot, uh, Giovanni, for providing a bit more insight also into the legal side of things and the uh, yeah the strategies behind the law for um, use in the Netherlands. In case people have questions, I already saw some questions coming in, but feel free to ask them in the chat box and we'll get back to you uh, later, Giovanni, during the, uh, the Q&A. And it's time for the third speaker of this evening, which is Lydia De Leo. Lydia is a researcher with SOMO, the Center for Research on Multinational Corporations based in Amsterdam where she investigates the involvement of companies in human rights violations, in particular in conflict affected areas. She also supports communities in their efforts to access remedy for corporate related human rights abuses. And before joining SOMO in 2015, she conducted research and advocacy for a variety of human rights organizations in Palestine, Lebanon, Jordan, and South Africa. Lydia also bachelor's and master's degree in criminology and an LLM in international crime and justice. Pretty impressive, Lydia. Uh, Lydia will share with us her personal case, um, one of the, the tactics that also the Giovanni already described, but Lydia will tell a bit more about that, and also the methods that are being used to repress Palestinian rights advocacy. Floor is yours, Lydia. Yeah, thank you, Thomas. Uh, good evening, everyone, or good morning, uh, or afternoon, wherever you are. Um, yeah, thank you for, for inviting me uh, to, join, uh, to join this panel and to discuss this really important issue that um, it's not going to go away anytime soon and, and makes it all the more important that we, yeah, we understand it properly and we, we organize together. Um, I'll share my screen um, if it works. I hope it works. Um, so now you should see uh, about SOMO. Yeah, I see Thomas nodding. Uh, so a little bit about SOMO because we're um, we might definitely not be familiar familiar to all of you. Um, SOMO is a NGO based in Amsterdam, and we indeed, like Thomas said, we investigate uh, multinational corporations around the globe um, where they violate human rights um, or have severe impacts on the environment. Uh, and we've been doing that since this, oh, I haven't been doing that since the seventies, but uh, the organization has been doing that for decades. Um, and Palestine is only one of the many places where we do such investigations. Um, 
I'll give a quick overview of the types of investigations that we have been conducting in Palestine, together with our partner organization, Al Haq. Um, so one is into the gas extraction offshore the Gaza Strip. Um, so some of you might be familiar with, um, um, with that case, which is uh, basically uh, foreign companies um, uh, in collaboration with the Israeli Navy and government are extracting uh, natural gas, which uh, either belongs to Palestine or they're extracting it and using the territory of Palestine to transfer it, which is also done in an illegal manner. Uh, and the gas is then subsequently used to um, uh, generate electricity, which goes directly into settlements. Um, so that's one of the things we have published about. Uh, another topic we focused on is agricultural industry in the settlements. Um, again, that I think uh, people in the Netherlands will be familiar with. Um, if you find fruits or vegetables in the supermarket with the, with the label Israel, there is no way of knowing whether that actually comes from settlements that have been illegally established in, uh, uh, on Palestinian land. Um, so we have been investigating that uh, through different methods, uh, really targeting the Dutch government and, and consumer also with information and requests, um, uh, which I presume also the Israeli government um, does not appreciate. Uh, a third topic we've been focusing on is uh, quarrying of stone in the West Bank. Again, uh, it's a Palestinian land that has been unlawfully expropriated. Foreign companies such as Heidelberg Cement, uh, a German company, come in, they, they accept the license that is, is basically you know, a fraudulent document because it is based on, uh, uh, on stealing. Uh, and they start extracting the natural resources from the Palestinians. Um, together with Al Haq, we did a, we did an extensive report on it. We have written also to the United Nations, uh, arguing that Heidelberg Cement definitely deserves a place on the uh, the UN database, the list of corporations that are involved in um, yeah supporting, maintaining, uh, or expanding uh, and constructing settlements in the West Bank. Um, yes, going to the to the database. Um, for several years, we have been together with Al-Haq and many, many other organizations uh, around the world, we have been pushing for that database to be developed, um, to be a strong instrument for corporate accountability and to at some point be published. And that happened last year, February, finally. Uh, and now we are pushing for um, an annual update of that list so that uh, corporations are uh, yeah, held to account and that we can all know um, who is doing what, where, um, and that follow-up actions are, are possible. Um, but yes, uh, in the background, of course, we, we also know and we also knew that there was a criminalization happening of, um, of people, of groups um, that spoke out against um, the, the pillaging happening in Palestine, um, but also more broadly uh, against the overall injustices of occupation, colonization, the denial of right of return. Um, so we as SOMA, we focus on a very small part, uh, which is corporate involvement, corporate uh, uh, complicity. Um, and th there was an amendment to the entry into Israel law, that's the legal foundation, supposedly, uh, of discriminalization. And it says that um, you, um, you are forbidden or you can be denied entry. Also, if you're a foreigner, you can be denied entry. If you have been engaging in an actual, consistent and continuous activity, aimed at promoting boycotts. Um, now that is, in my view anyway, it, it is very vague language and you could, you could interpret this in different ways. Um, so when we say, you know, the criminalization of BDS, I, I do put it in, in brackets there or in, in, in hyphens because um, there, is no, there is no such thing as the the as there's no mathematical definition of BDS, uh, let's say. There's no, uh, when I was being interrogated, but I'll get to that later. I also joked to the interrogator saying that, you know, should I have a membership card? Should I have signed something to say that I sign on to uh, to this group? Uh, it's 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 something that is constructive, but constructed politically. Um, so when it first started being used um, to keep foreigners out, it was selective targeting of individuals. Not necessarily people who had a lot to do, um, you know, it, the frontline BDS activism, but simply people that were, were going to be framed as such to try and, you know, with the aim to scare away uh, critics uh, and, and scare away people who would 
feel somehow affiliated or uh, uh, connected to those advocacy messages that were being carried. Um, so yeah, then in July 2018, uh, to, to put it skeptically, um, uh, it was our turn uh, as SOMO. We, uh, myself and uh, my colleague Pauline Overeem, we, we were traveling uh, uh, into Israel-Palestine in July 2018, um, but upon arrival uh, at Ben Gurion Airport, um, there was an unpleasant surprise, which was um, yeah, some type of interrogation. Um, and in my case, there was also there was already a, a file of some sort with with basically with screenshots of my social media posts from years ago, lying on the desk, uh, and it was already a decision ready on the table saying you will be denied entry based on this uh, uh, legislation legislation and uh, you are BDS and well sign this and we can send you back to Amsterdam. Uh, I didn't sign, I did get sent back to Amsterdam. Um, yeah, and what happened next is we have been, well, the, the first thing, no, maybe I should take one step back. Um, what I found striking about the way that the denied entry was conducted um, is that it was um, uh, conducted in a way to not just, it, it wasn't about me, I don't think it was about me uh, necessarily, um, but it was very much outward, uh, outwardly directed. So um, when I was still being interrogated, um, there was already, um, news was already being pushed out by the Ministry of Strategic Affairs, the Ministry of Interior through Israeli media to say that I had been stopped at the border at the airport uh, I had been denied entry. I was a BDS activist, and and but you know they were not going to tolerate people like me coming into the country. So it was about sending that message to an audience outside. You know, people that are critical of what is happening uh, in Palestine and uh, who are speaking out. I think the message was to them. Uh, also, another reason why I believe that is because uh, for the whole time that I was in interrogation until I was put back on the plane. Um, my belongings were taken from me, including my phone, uh, uh, quite violently. There was no way of me for me to access a phone, which people around me in the waiting room, you know, for people that were going to be kicked out, everyone was on their phone, um, but I was denied access to my phone. And every official I asked, you know, can I use my phone? I need to make some phone calls. I have the right to call my embassy. I have the right to this, that, and the other. Um, and they all had this pre- uh, uh, pre-recorded sentence almost saying um, no you're not allowed to have your phone and when I would ask why they would say um, yeah we received orders we received orders from the highest level so it it, it was clear to me that it was um, in that sense it was well organized and the purpose was for me not it was the purpose was so that I couldn't get my message out so that I couldn't uh, resist the, um, the, the the deportation so that I couldn't, for example, make a legal challenge or say, well, just put me in detention and I'll, I'll stay here until this is sorted out. That was all uh, not an option. Um, yeah, so then what happened next? We engaged the Dutch authorities, asking them to, uh, well, condemn, but also asking them to obtain more information because uh, other than a little piece of paper that I didn't sign, there was nothing that would justify or that would explain why I was denied entry. And for my colleague Pauline, um, there was not even any, there was nothing, there was no paper waiting for her uh, um, and she was not given a reason for why she was denied entry. Um, we've re requested information from the Israeli authorities to no avail. Uh, and when all of that didn't work, we started legal proceedings. Um, the, long, the, the long story short is that um, we were denied access to information uh, on all accounts. We filed Freedom of Information Act requests with the Israeli authorities, and uh, they simply weren't giving further information until it was appealed and appealed. And then finally, our lawyers, uh, they did obtain uh, some underlying documents. Uh, which was, it was basically a political screening and uh, a listing of the work that we had been doing, also as SOMO. So it made clear to us that possibly the research and the advocacy that we had been doing as SOMO, um, yeah, made us end up on, on their radar. Um, 
so yeah, again, it's a political screening process. Um, this was, we thought it was very necessary to put in all the effort to get the information because we did understand also after speaking with, with you know, people who can know, people who are on the Palestinian side and, and people who've been working on shrinking civic space for years, they all say, transparency is your friend. Um, you, you are doing the work that you're doing. You know, there's no obvious reason for why you shouldn't be allowed in. So put the burden of proof, the burden of proof on them as much as possible. So the more information that comes out on you, about you, uh, and about the reasons for your denied entry, the better it is, and the better, the stronger it makes your case. And the, the more obvious it becomes to the Dutch government what this is all about, which is the, the broad context of shrinking civic space. Um, so going to the Dutch government, we, we asked them to raise it with the Israeli authorities. They have raised it, but also, again, repeated that this is a, an issue of sovereignty. Every, uh, every government has the right to decide who enters into their territory and who doesn't. Um, and they don't take a position because they say, well, we don't have all the details. We don't quite know. Um, so yeah, that has been quite frustrating and, and that hasn't really changed. Um, but I'll get back to that later when I speak about the larger context. Um, yeah, as I said, finally, we, we got some information um, that shows that our research work was connected to the denied entry. So what is next? Um, the legal challenge of the, the decision to deny our entry uh, led to nothing. <laughs> and uh, ironically, you know, the Israeli court eventually said, or the authorities eventually said, um, you cannot challenge this decision of your denied entry anymore because you're too late. Uh, well, the reason we were <laughs> late in challenging is because we never got any information to base our, uh, our legal challenge on. So uh, we were set up to fail, obviously. Um, but we are trying something new, which is challenging the, the status, the denied entry status, because that is something that is a legal status that has been imposed upon us, a denied entry status. Um, our lawyers discovered that um, um, such a denied entry status in and of itself has never been legally challenged before. Um, so we are doing it now. And if the court confirms that you can place you can legally challenge it, the, the, the denied entry status, then that might, we hope, that might set a positive precedent for, for anyone facing the same uh, um, yeah, designation. There are, I think there must be thousands of people, people from the Palestinian diaspora, uh, activists, critics, journalists, um, who have this, this uh, denied entry status. So if that can be, because it is a legal status, mm -hmm. and if it can be legally challenged, um, if the court says it can be legally challenged, that, that would hopefully open the door to, um, yeah, some successful proceedings by others as well, and will hopefully raise the, um, the threshold for, for the Israeli state to, to just do that, you know, just hand out these red stamps and passports and say, um, you're denied entry. The second thing we are doing is continuing our work. Uh, so there's, there's no reason for us to stop working. Uh, on the issues we've been working on, yes, it becomes more difficult because we can no longer um, uh, physically access uh, Palestine. Um, but working together with Al Haq and other groups in Palestine uh, is, of course, still possible and necessary. So that's one important thing that we will do: is just continuing to work and try not to let this drain our resources, um, because that's also very easy to to have happen that you know you get into the legal battles and you, you kind of lose sight of the work you're actually doing what we think should be next on the part of the dutch government and other third states is to respond to the broader pattern of shrink shrinking civic space so the case of me and pauline is you know this size in the whole um in the whole grand scheme of things um but there are patterns patterns and there are there are always new developments and what is happening now with the designation of the six NGOs uh, is just the latest phase in that uh, uh, in that policy in in that approach of shrinking civic space. Um, and the the it's not an excuse, but the the response often given by third states, including the Netherlands, is you know we need more information. We don't have all the facts. Let's wait to see all the facts. 
But that is exactly what author authoritarian regimes will use is to say, well, there's secret evidence. Um, you know, this is under investigation. This is intelligence. Um, and they'll, they'll just say, you know, they can just put the accusation out there, um, put you on the defense if you're not, yeah, it, if it works out in, in, a, in, a, in an awful way, you will be put on the defense. And third states will not take position, which means you're left hanging potentially without funding or with the risk of imprisonment, arrests, etc. cetera. Um, so there needs to be a proactive stance. You, you cannot let authoritarian regimes like the Israeli government uh, um, yeah, dictate how civil society can or cannot uh, um, yeah, uh, have space um, to conduct itself. So it needs to be recognized for what it is. This is an attack on civic space. And um, if, there is, if there is any evidence, I'm sure that the Israeli authorities would have shared it a long time ago. Um, so it needs to be recognized for what it is. It's not any different from any other authoritarian regime um, that we see around the world. And I think for wider civil society, uh, we have a complementary role to play to that of states. So I think first and foremost, states have the responsibility to protect human rights. It's an act of obligation uh, and we complement it. We, um, uh, we don't have to take on the burden of that responsibility, but we complement by supporting each other, showing solidarity, organizing events like this um, um, to analyze, organize, uh, strategize. Uh, and I think, yeah, um, I think we are doing it. We need to conti continue doing it. Um, and yeah, and, and at some point, <laughs> at some point the pushback will be successful, but um, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's a struggle. I think um, uh, in the Netherlands, we, we are now pushing for the Dutch government to take a better position, which will hopefully, um, yeah, will hopefully come through in the coming weeks or, or months. Um, yeah, but there's, I think, uh, um, no, as Giovanni said, there's no reason for us to be um, worried about implications here. Um, and we shouldn't be distracted by, by these new policies and, and, and decisions. Um, uh, yeah, let's continue what we're doing. And the fact that these rules are being made shows that the support from outside um, is something that the Israeli government is worried about and tries to cut off. Um, so I guess that we're doing something right. Yeah, that's all I had to share. Thanks a lot, Lydia, for this uh, more personal story. Uh, I think also to, yeah, you can see the trends that happened in your case that Giovanni also described and that are happening now in the current designations that uh, we some also talked about. Um, then we now move on to the Q&A part. I already saw quite some questions coming in. Um, I saw that there were three similar questions or like one similar question for all three speakers. So let's start with that one. Um, what would be your main message to people here listening? What can people do about this? Um, maybe we can start with we Sam, if that's possible, then we make a round. Sure, thank you very much, uh, Thomas, for the question. And, you know, it, it isn't... Uh... I mean, uh, we can list a lot of suggestions, but really I have faith in uh, the individual uh, and uh, their own ability to uh, develop uh, um, uh, their understanding of their own context and the role that they can play within their particular situation, whether they're in uh, positions of power in politics or um, in business or in academia. Uh, every uh, individual can play a role in, in challenging uh, this issue, but also keeping in mind that, uh, uh, you know, the fact that we are still operating today after these issues, uh, in my mind, shows that the, really the, the, the main target is you, you, the external support structure, the, uh, the support system that exists that uh, uh, allows Palestinian solidarity uh, to uh, to develop and, and the message to be amplified, and the the tactic of uh, using this uh, issue of terrorist designation is really an attempt to scare you away from this continued support, scare you from raising it in academia, in politics, in uh, in business, and uh, in order to counter that, we have to recognize 
uh, how it's being used against us in a, uh, in a psychological manner. And that empowers us to be able to confront it. And I think uh, um, different individuals have different uh, capacities that they can uh, develop using their particular individual situation. And it is at these times when we face uh, adversity as a collective, where uh, some of the most uh, um, innovative ideas to counter can, uh, can develop. And so what I wanna encourage uh, um, those that want to do something is rather than wait for a specific uh, action to be taken um, or, or given a particular instruction from any one of us is to think, uh, where are you in your, this particular system and what it is that you can do as an individual. And I have full confidence that if all of us are working together in the same direction, regardless of the, uh, if those actions are being coordinated or not, so long as the direction is the same, it will have a positive impact. Thanks, Wissam. Anything to add, uh, Giovanni? Uh, it's difficult to add something more because I fully endorse what, what Wissam said, and he said it in such a nice way with very accurate words. Um, yeah, no, I again, I, I fully agree. I, I think that we must be aware we are all part of a single movement, which is based on different actors, where you have activists, academics, students, uh, um, human rights advocates, uh, so the most important thing is uh, joining this, I would say, uh, in uh, with that. But this really follows what what Wesam was also saying. So yeah, I nothing more to add. Said that. Thanks, Giovanni. Yeah. Yeah. What what to add to Wesam? <laughs> I agree as well, a hundred percent. Yeah, I think. Um, in addition to, to, to what we Sam said, um, uh, don't, I mean, if anything, all of this should be an encouragement for us all. Uh, it means we're, we're clearly, uh, you know, there's clearly a threat coming from our collective efforts, you know, of some sort. Um, so don't uh, take it as an encouragement rather than uh, something to scare us, uh, to scare us off. Um, I think it's a sign that we were moving and shaking things. Uh, and also, um, as an individual, it might, I mean, having focused on human rights issues in Palestine for, for some years now, uh, it is easy to feel discouraged or to feel hopeless at times. And, you know, we're all human. And I think it's fine to uh, sometimes, you know, not have, not feel the energy or not feel the, feel that we're getting anywhere, but um, we're all just doing our little parts and it's about, you know, our collective impact. So I think, you know, Keep your, keep your chin up, keep doing your own little thing, whether it is in a trade union or in your university or asking, you know, just the other day I was at, at a halal butcher in our neighborhood and he was selling dates from Israel. And I asked him, what are you doing? And we had a 20 minute conversation. Um, it's the small things that you can do. Um, um, so keep doing the small things in addition to the little things. Um, and yeah, don't don't get discouraged. Uh, also, I think for every national context, because I mean we're here, here convened around you know links to the the Dutch context, which was um, uncovered in the ELSC reports. Um, it can help to connect things to a threat that is closer to home, um, like exactly like ELSC has been doing. Um, but also journalists that are pointing out how the spyware of Pegasus is being used by other regimes in other situations. So um, show to a larger audience that, you know, this threat will come to you eventually. It's not going to, Pegasus is not going to stay in its laboratory uh, targeting Palestinians. It's going to come into your computer, into your phone, um, whenever some government or authority decides that it wants to. Um, so not not targeting the um how, how would i put it the the egocentrism of people but people will see their self-interest as well um that that all of the military surveillance uh, uh testing you know that's happening in in the lab called the gaza strip um that is going to it's already here uh, and we need to show to people that if you don't stand up for human rights against the authoritarian regime colonial regime elsewhere um it will be imported here eventually 
Um, so make the connections when you can. Uh, I think that is that is helpful. And and I'm grateful to ELSC and, and to anyone who has been doing that in, in recent years. Yeah, thanks, Leah. Just to add indeed on this, because I forgot to, to say that too, it's actually important. And indeed, it's important to speak out. And in case you face any kind of any form of repression, to let us know and inform us, because we, I mean, this is the main uh, the, the main goal of our organization is to support people who are facing issues. So also, if any one of you have any kind of issues, let's please contact us. <laughs> And also, if uh, if I can add uh, as well, uh, I mean, uh, the the message that uh, we've heard about, uh, especially from Lydia, and and the importance of the work that they're doing and that we're all doing, and how it's it's the nature of that work and the message uh, that it delivers is really what uh, scares uh, Israel and and what leads them to take this action. And uh, their attempt to try to silence the messenger needs to be taken as an opportunity to amplify the message. And their uh, desire to isolate the six organizations as if uh, the, the message will somehow disappear is very similar to the anti-BDS legislation as well. But it is taking these uh, attempts to restrict the message and amplifying it on your part is, uh, is uh, one of the uh, tactics that uh, we can use uh, to... Uh, to really just simply uh, uh, take away the force of what they are trying to do uh, by countering it with an even stronger message. And you know, the, the Palestinian uh, injustices that we face are really a microcosm of global injustice. And, and we see similar things uh, in different parts of the world. And uh, you know, I, I, of course, appreciate the efforts with regard to Palestinian solidarity, but I also very much appreciate the, the work being done on uh, addressing injustices in different parts of the world as well, because those injustices, when they are confronted, they are confronting the injustices that the Palestinians are facing as well, because this injustice is very much a global issue that needs to be addressed. Thanks a lot, Wissam, and also Lydia and uh, Giovanni. I saw an interesting question popping up about the ICC investigation, uh, and I want to take it a bit broader, if you allow me. Uh, so what consequences does the um, designation of the six NGOs have for the ICC investigation? And I would like to take it two ways. So on the one hand, does it influence the information provision by the designated uh, organization? Does that influence the, uh, yeah, the position of the NGOs? Uh, and also the other way around. So does potentially the designation uh, could be part of the investigation at all? Um, sorry if I'm making it a bit more difficult, but... We Sam, maybe to give the floor to you as first, maybe the others to add. Sure. Uh, I mean, I'll address the second question first because I think that's the more uh, challenging one that I really don't have an answer to how it, it would play out in the broader investigation. Obviously, the ICC is set up to address the most grave crimes, and uh, um, uh, you know this issue is is important. But I don't know if uh, the ICC, considering everything else it has on its table, that this would be one of the things it would take into consideration uh, with regard to how uh, the designation addresses the the um, influences the information going to the ICC. I think this is, you know, part of the reason Israel is taking these steps against uh, Palestinian civil society, particularly um, some of those organizations are very much involved in the ICC process and providing information. And uh, the, the thought uh, that uh, by uh, eliminating these organizations, we eliminate the flow of the information into the ICC. Um, again, uh, this is uh, this can be uh, countered by showing that uh, others are also able to submit uh, similar information. Uh, the information that, that we provide uh, is uh, is important, but it's also uh, you know a, a part of uh, a lot of the other information that can be collected and gathered, and having uh, additional actors beyond us uh, submitting information uh, with regard to the ICC, um, again, uh, uh, undermining Israel's attempt to uh, circumvent the, the flow of information to the ICC by targeting us as individual organizations, because it is the, the crimes that are being committed that are being addressed uh, uh, by us, and those can also be addressed by others. Thanks a lot, Lydia and Giovanni. Anything to add? Or... Yeah. Uh, oh, 
You want to go first, Joanne? No, no, no. Go ahead, because um, I know thing I thought. <laughs> well, I think, um, and I hope I'm not oversimplifying it, but I do think the answer to the question might be very straightforward. Um, so the ICC, indeed, it investigates war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide, acts of genocide. Um, and I think what the, the, the designation of the six organizations, um, um, I don't think even the, uh, not even the accusation amounts to something that would fall under the Rome statute, um, uh, I think. Um, but also for the prosecutor, for the office of the prosecutor of the ICC, um, to include it in uh, in their investigations, uh, there would have to be, you know, evidence. There would have to be something communicated to them. There would have to be, um, there would have to be ample reason for them to um, to devote time and resources into investigating the potential terrorist nature of these groups. And since there is no evidence, um, I think um, there's no need for the Office of the Prosecutor to, to, to look into this at all. But that's my hopefully not oversimplified view. Uh, and the other is um, the impacts on the investigation, the information provision. Uh, time will tell. Uh, I hope not. And at this point, it doesn't look like it. Like, like we Sam said, you know, the, the target seems to be, um, you know, the outside supporters of Al Haq and Al Damir and all the others. Uh, it's, you know, to scare away funders, it's to, to cut off uh, uh, the lifeline, really, for some organizations. So as long as that doesn't happen, and the groups that are providing information to the ICC can continue their work, um, then it shouldn't have an impact. But that's really a loss. That's on us. That's on our governments. That's on the EU. That's on all, you know, all the, 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 the bodies that, that are involved in funding and support to these, um, to these groups. So, and in terms of Israel's um, collaboration or cooperation, I should say, with the ICC, there's nothing lost there um, because they are not collaborating. Um, so I, I don't yet see anything lost on, on, unless we let them. And if I can add that uh, you uh, uh, just triggered another idea that uh, um, uh, I've heard in the discussions as well uh, outside of this uh, specific uh, um, uh, panel discussion, but the issue of uh, the obstruction of justice uh, and, and the fact that those actors that are taking these steps against us are the same actors uh, that uh, could be subject uh, to the jurisdiction of the ICC and how these steps could be seen as an attempt to obstruct uh, the ICC's work. Um, this might be something that some of our uh, participants might be interested in looking at further as well. Thanks, Wissam. Also, thanks, Lydia. Um, then the next question, quite some questions came in about uh, the role of companies. So um, the focus has been quite a lot on uh, EU and government and what they should do, uh, but a significant effect also do have the private companies uh, as they are also part of the problem. Cultural domination narrative is critical for fully campaigning for Palestinian rights. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, I know, Lydia, that you touched upon it a bit on the role of companies. Um, could you maybe elaborate a bit more on that? And if you see also a link um, with, with companies and, and this, this whole repression and what they could, what role they could play, maybe in light of the UN database. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, well, in, in the broader scale, like, yeah, there's so many levels, right? So there's companies in relation to civic space. So maybe I'll address that first. Um, well, you know, we, we have, or we, um, not me personally, um, um, people more broadly, um, have been calling out uh, social media companies for the censoring of Palestinian voices. Um, there's the, yeah, there's uh, Hamle, the Palestinian group, there's there's collectives outside Palestine as well, um, that, yeah, that are, that are really calling out these companies and saying, listen, you are part of the problem, you are you are conducting the shrinking of civic space um, by your actions um, and by deleting or blocking Palestinian accounts, et cetera. So, so I think that's the, very, that's the most obvious link you know, between the Palestinian civil context of civil society and, um, uh, and private corporations, um, where really they are not operating in line with, um, with their obligations. So they're not respecting human rights. 
Um, and, and for that, I think we need to keep pushing them and um, wherever we can, um, yeah, get, get it publicly on the record that it is not, um, it is not okay, it's not justified, it is contrary to the international standards on business and human rights. Um, and yeah, we need to educate them clearly, um, unfortunately. Then uh, more broadly, um, another example is, you know, companies can divest from, you know, their involvement in uh, unlawful acts in, in, in Palestine. And they do, you know, sometimes it's a pension fund, sometimes it's, uh, it can be any type of company. Um, and it would be most helpful if those companies do issue strong statements as they leave, as they responsibly divest from, uh, from those violations. Uh, so for example, when Ben and Jerry's uh, pulled out, it was very, I thought it was very vague. And when I looked at their statement on their website, they said, we are, you know, we are withdrawing from there specifically because it's contrary to our policies. Well, please just say what that is. I mean, mention the word human rights somewhere, mention the word uh, violations somewhere. And they didn't do that. So I think companies should use their privilege and should use their position um, and the, 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 the reach they have with their with their media um, channels, but also the attention they surely will know uh, 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 their announcements attract. They should they have the 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 the, the luxury of setting an example, um, so they should use it. And I don't think they always um, they always um, uh, take the full possibility. I, I'm reading the question in the chat. Um, Yes, they're part of the problem. Cultural domination and narrative is critical for fully campaigning for Palestinian rights. Um, yeah, that, that's the other thing. And I think it was called out as well. For example, Netflix um, uh, until very recently had the, I mean, it, the content is still on there. The worst uh, insidious content in relation to, you know, kind of, um, of course, a racist portrayal of Arabs in general and then Palestinians in particular as you know, there's something terrorist about, about them. Um, uh, I mean, we all know the examples that, that are existing on Netflix. And even, I think it was uh, Al-Haq that was mentioned in Homeland at some point. It's just, it is ridiculous. It's crazy. And it was called out um, by civil society. And now about a month ago, I believe, uh, uh, a couple dozen of, um, you know, Palestinian produced, um, uh, films, documentaries, and series were, were added under the header of Palestinian stories. Um, so I think narrative, cultural narrative, uh, uh, awareness, um, and countering that racism that is underlying a lot of that content, I think, um, uh, is important as well, because um, I think it is interrelated. I mean, the Black Lives Matter movement has made the connections beautifully, which is great, um, but the for a broader audience to have open ears and eyes, I think there is sometimes also a barrier um, to overcome, which which is really caused by, you know, by these by these harmful narratives that are being uh, uh, put out there. So, I've only addressed like a few minor minor examples. Um, yeah, the do no harm is the overarching one. Like, don't be linked or involved in violations, but but there's more they can do than just that. If I can add uh, as well, and I think uh, you know the, the role of corporations fits within this uh, broader economic incentive structure that uh, Israel has um, in, in the refinement of its uh, best business practice of colonialism. And, uh, and the issue of uh, the development of research and technology uh, in this, uh, the, the cyber uh, area is a, is a case in point of how Israel is able to make use of uh, the captive population to develop such technology, not only use it uh, um, uh, against the Palestinian population, but also export it abroad. And those exports are to willing buyers. And those buyers, uh, support the uh, economic incentive structure for Israel to continue because it is reaping a benefit from its activities. And uh, to put it in a more direct, uh, maybe actionable point uh, to you as European civil society and, and Dutch uh, civil society in particular, these relationships that Israel has in agreements such as the Horizon Agreement on Research uh, Cooperation, uh, 
I think, uh, you know, this is an important opportunity uh, for, uh, for you to step up and say, uh, we need to freeze these kind of agreements until we better understand how these agreements uh, and, and the kind of cooperation is contributing to this issue as well. Um, and I think, uh, you know, a, a full inquiry into the EU's relationship with Israel uh, in areas of research and development and trade and investment, how this is contributing to the development uh, of such technologies and their use and abuse, uh, not only within the Palestinian context, but elsewhere as well. And uh, I think this is uh, one of the things that could be done in a very immediate sense uh, to put a freeze on uh, moving forward with uh, agreements such as the Horizon Agreement. Because so long as uh, there's this sense that there are benefits being reaped uh, through this cooperation, uh, then the, the violations that are being committed during the course of this research and development uh, will be seen as uh, simply secondary to the benefits uh, that are being reaped from it. And obviously this uh, has uh, uh, a very long reaching ramifications of uh, the impact uh, on, uh, on you know, the society as a whole in a global sense uh, that we need to uh, step up uh, and, and try to address. Thanks a lot, uh, we, um, go ahead, Giovanni. You know, just for very briefly, because indeed they are already Lydia and some addressed the topic very, very well. And I would like, and as Lydia also was saying, we have different levels. You know, I mean, we have companies who are involved in uh, enforcing human rights relation in Palestine, or we have companies which are enforced in enabling shrinking space as social media platforms. For instance, I would just focus on the second one because are the companies we mostly dealing with, which actually are social media platforms or banks and financial providers, which indeed most of the time, let's say, they uh, surrender they, uh, to, 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 to the delegation coming from low actors, and uh, by doing so, they ban pro Palestinian voices. Uh, in this case, uh, first of all, if you have, I mean, I will repeat this again, it's always to me very, very important to uh, don't surrender and organize, organize and organize even more to, to react. Because our experience is that most of the time when people, I don't know, they, they delete your Facebook page or uh, um, they block you on Instagram, most of the time people just get scared and, and take, a step, take a step back. What we actually notice is that when people are connected with each other and when they are supported, it's, it's, absolute, it's actually possible to, to fight back and to push back. And, and this is possible only if people are organized themselves collectively and are, su and are supported. Uh, um, we just put it in the chat uh, this, this form by AMLE report. If you have any incidents with social media platform, report this to them, uh, okay? Because we have direct access also with, with, with these companies that can speak with them. And, 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 and in general, also for, 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 for other companies and bank providers, we had some experience with, with them. And in some cases, it's absolutely possible to come out because all these companies are just very also afraid of the reputational damage. So when you, know, you can show a pattern of discrimination of a specific company against a specific group of, of people, and you start calling out for what it is, companies will think it twice the next time. Because for them, most of the time, it's a business decision, which is based on pro and cons on how much they earn or how much they will lose. That's it. But when they realize that the reputational damage they can face because people start organizing and, and, and calling them out for what they're doing publicly, that, well, next time they will think twice for sure. So that's, that's it. Thanks a lot, uh, Giovanni. And also we send for that addition of uh, Lydia. Um, then one specific question directed to Giovanni. In light of the suppression of civic space, you mentioned the um, defunding as one of the, the targets that, or one of the um, approaches that's being used, one of the strategies. Um, can the Dutch state have an influence on Dutch banks to prevent them from stopping their financial services to the designated NGOs? Uh, yes, uh, by making a very strong, taking a very strong statement, rejecting the designation. Uh, because it's just a matter, also here, it's just a matter of legitimacy. If, uh, and it's a matter of risk, you know, like Bank of this 
these, 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 these service providers, they don't want to take any risk. So if uh, the Dutch government take a really strong stance uh, saying that there is no risk, uh, the designation must be rejected because it violates fundamental rights. I mean, if I reject it, uh, then uh, this will, will surely have uh, huge consequences for financial service providers and banks as well. So then again, the point would be to make political pressure to push the government to take such a, such a step, I would say. Thanks a lot, uh, Giovanni. And then a question for clarification came in during the talk um, about where about the legality of the decision. So first, it seems like that the decision was only valid for Israel, and then later a military order followed, making it also uh, applicable to the occupied Palestinian territory. Um, how does that work exactly? Because that means that there are two different systems, and is it normally that so first something becomes law in Israel and then follows by a military order in the occupied Palestinian territory. Maybe we Sam would be the best person to, to go for this, this question about the legal um, system. No, I, I don't think I would be the best, but uh, I will uh, try to address it in the sense that, uh, you know, the, the fact of uh, two different systems operating uh, um, is, uh, is, part of uh, you know the indicators of an apartheid regime and, and that's how uh, it uh, it is being uh, developed uh, and then uh, apartheid is a part of the broader uh, uh, strategy of colonialism as a policy and I think uh, um, it, you know the, there were questions raised about the, the the move on the Ministry of Defense first then the issuance of the military order um, but I don't think it's worth speculating on the the direct implications because we see uh, these issues as being very much political in nature, um, and I think uh, we should uh, make sure that we uh, continue to push back on the political level and not get lost in the uh, legal nuances uh, because that becomes part of the uh, strategy of distraction as well. Thanks. Anyone, anything to add, Giovanni or Lydia? No. Good. There we are almost at the end. So if you still want to ask a question, please do so now. Uh, now there's still, uh, still time. There's also a discussion I see in the chat around the using the word shrinking civil, civil space, which is quite an interesting one, I think. Um, so there's a comment for every one person who is silenced. There are tens of thousands more that are speaking out against uh, the crime Israel's apartheid regime in this case. Um, how do you reflect on that? So indeed, like it seems like also with this decision um, that while there are six organizations being labeled as terrorists, that a lot of civil society organizations are speaking out, a lot of media organizations are speaking out. Could it also have a kind of a positive effect of really showing what is going on to more people or would it be too positive of an uh, interpretation? Maybe starting with Didia. Um, yeah, I, I want to believe that it has, at least it has a, a, a positive impact on awareness of people outside uh, of Palestine, uh, of what, of what the system is about, you know, it's about oppression, it's about um, uh, extraction of resources, it is about domination. So, um, yes, I want to believe that it, it you know, this these are the kinds of um, events that show the true colors and the true nature of the political system. Um, um, but it's, um, it's not a given that it is properly portrayed and contextualized uh, and narrated in our media. Um, so we as civil society, I think we are trying to do what we can um, and we should do what we can to make sure that it is properly understood, interpreted and um, uh, uh, recognized for what it is, um, but I, at least in the Dutch context, I do see, um, I do very slowly, but I do see uh, a shift for in, in the right direction. Um, um, yeah, there's, in media, there's, they often say there's an Israel-Palestine fatigue, and I'm sure that's true, um, but it's, um, it's no longer something outrageous to say, um, you know, that there's an occupation and a racist system uh, in place in Palestine. That's, it's kind of common knowledge now that something is really uh, wrong. So um, 
apart from the disastrous impacts on, on Palestinians of all these developments, um, it is showing to the outside, it is showing the true colors um, uh, and, and intention of the policies. Um, and it, I think also, last point, in, in, a, in the Dutch context, uh, I think um, when it is about, you know, restricting uh, freedom of expression or when it is about, you know, putting in, in uh, putting a ban on, on human rights groups, etc. I do think that strikes a particular chord here with people. That's that's when they start to notice that something is really off. Um, so yeah, we just need to make sure that it's yeah it keeps getting uh, the attention and that that the interpretation of it happens uh, happens correctly. I think that's really important. Thanks a lot, Lydia, uh, for answering that. I also just saw in the chat that uh, someone mentioned that the Reporters Without Borders awarded prizes today um, and that two of the uh, people who won are a Palestinian journalist and the people behind the Pegasus project. Um, so that's also an interesting development, I think, in light of this. Uh, and also a question came in related to that, the discovery or kind of related. The discovery of the surveillance by the Israeli NSO group seems connected to the designation. What can the Netherlands and the EU do about this illegal surveillance? So it's really about this, um, yeah, the surveillance in general. We talked already about it a bit. Uh, is there anyone who would like to tell a bit more about that or elaborate a bit more about that? Maybe Giovanni? I will leave also, I think also with Sam as something, I will leave the floor to him first if he wants. Sure. And yes, I would have a couple of ideas on what Netherlands and you could do on this. So we sent the question what, uh, what the Netherlands and the EU could do about this illegal surveillance around the. Uh, and yeah, I, I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, the issue of uh, conducting an inquiry into understanding uh, what role the EU relationship uh, with regard to uh, research and development, uh, um, uh, trade and investment uh, and, and understanding the connections uh, between the development and use uh, and abuse of such technology um, and how the EU's relationship with Israel is contributing uh, to this is, uh, is very important and uh, and uh, um, essential to really understand uh, and, and not disconnect uh, the uh, relationships on areas of research and development to what is happening uh, on the ground. Yeah, and in addition, I think that one thing that could be done uh, would be, I mean, regarding, for instance, NSO, which is the company which uh, is selling Pegasus, like the United States, uh, this Home Department, they ban, they blacklisted the NSO, which means they cannot, if I'm not mistaken, they cannot sell uh, or anything in the United States, which is a huge financial uh, backlash for them. Uh, and I think that in the light of what happens to the dear colleagues of al Haq, I think and that the European Union and Netherlands should push for a similar ban in Europe as well. Uh, because it's, it's kind of ludicrous that, that companies which have a long history on record of uh, uh, selling this kind of softwares to authoritarian regimes uh, and, and, and now also using the softwares against human rights defenders that the European Union also financed and supported should be, I think, a legitimate concern and, and should be also the right moment for, for, uh, for avoiding that this company can 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 work in Europe and if they can uh, continue their economical transaction with European actors, I, I think. And maybe a small addition. Um, and I, in addition to that, I, I think the European Union and member states, including the Netherlands, need to take another critical look at the loopholes and the gaps in their laws because um, yes, they can blacklist companies like NSO Group and they should do so, um, there's all the reason for them to do so. Um, but I think that the protections and the safeguards um, for us as citizens or for people living here um, are not are not fully in place. There are still definitely things lacking in terms of digital protections, safeguards, privacy, etc. Um, so that need that whole system is in need of um, of improvement. Um, an advancement because it, it hasn't kept up with the technological developments. So that's a more broad issue that goes beyond NSO Group. But in the meantime, yes, um, NSO Group has nothing to do here, should have no business here. 
Thanks a lot. Uh, and uh, I listen. think an additional point uh, is how Israel is again marketing itself as a hub for uh, investment uh, and and uh, multinational corporations to come and uh, and uh, develop uh, data centers and server farms. Um, and uh, you can imagine the dangers of having all this uh, uh, information as as Europe is. Uh, um, elevating its concerns and actions with regard to privacy to put such information in the hands of the Israeli authorities uh, that we've seen how they are able to use uh, such information in a manner that uh, undermines the, uh, the privacy and, and uh, the ability to, uh, uh, to uh, um, operate uh, in general. Uh, and I think uh, this should be something of concern for, uh, for European and Dutch citizens as well. Thanks a lot. Um, I think we came to the end of this webinar. I want to thank everyone a lot for asking questions, also for sharing ideas and um, things in the chat. A lot of interesting documents and articles all, also popped by, I saw. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Also, really thanks a lot to our speakers, Hissam, Lydia, Giovanni, to the organizing team of ELSC behind the scenes for dealing with the questions and organizing all the technical stuff behind the scenes. and. Um, Hope to see you again at the next webinar. Have a nice evening or day, wherever you are. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone.